Welcome to rebuilding a large Clarkson single cylinder vertical steam engine and this is all about using studs and the time has come. I really have been dreading this because I do not like repetition and there's a lot of repetition going to be going on here. I have to shorten these studs to all become the right length for the job. Most of them are too long because they had lock nuts on them. So here we go then. I'll have a quick look with just one of them. And this one's okay, so I'll Loctite it in place. For retaining the studs, I'm using Loctite 603. This will hold the studs in place into the cylinder casting, so that if anyone at a future time wants to dismantle the engine, it will be a simple job to just remove the nuts without the entire stud coming out. And, oh, deep joy, quite a lot of these studs were the right length anyway. They were just not fully in the holes. The ones that were over long I simply put in the lathe and machined a little bit off and the other good news is that actually going into the holes with my fingers rather than having to use either a pair of pliers or double lock nuts so the holes are not brilliantly tapped they're a little bit oversized maybe the guy who built the engine had the shakes and wobbled about a lot as he tapped the holes in the cylinder my sure there are quite a lot of holes to tap it's very important to make sure that these studs are all the same length, so you will see me checking the length with a ruler from time to time. At this stage of the video, I was going to say nothing looks worse than over long studs, or studs that are not all of the same length. But with the current state of the world, quite a lot of things look worse than this really. I could of course say a lot more, but this is a video about rebuilding a steam engine, and I have a policy of never discussing religion or politics and that way it's impossible to fall out. Well, almost impossible anyway. Here you see me tightening some of the studs that are a little bit stubborn. I'm using a pair of pliers, but note where I'm using the pair of pliers, near the cylinder itself, not on the end where the nut's going to go. And once again, frequent testing with the ruler is essential. This is a slow and quite tedious job, and sometimes the pliers method does not work, and you have to put a couple of lock nuts on, like you see here, and then tighten down the stud. One or two of these studs have been a little bit too stubborn and I don't want to chew them up excessively with a pair of pliers, so this is the way to do it. And don't forget to check with the ruler. When using Loctite products, most of which are retainers or thread sealants, you have to be very careful. Don't dawdle too much because otherwise the stud will start to go solid in the hole. Generally speaking though, there's sufficient time to allow you to get the stud into the hole. This stud is not tight in the hole, but the lock nuts were already on the stud, so I thought I'll put it into the hole, then remove the lock nut, which is what I'm doing at the moment. Loctite retainers are really good for retaining bearings, and they're particularly good for retaining the wheels onto the axles of miniature steam locomotives. In the dim and distant past, before the modern range of Loctite adhesives came out, you generally pressed the axle into the wheel. But I cracked the cast iron of the wheel on the first one that I ever did, and after that I thought, now nah, I'll use Loctite, and then peg the wheel from behind. The next thing to look at is the gasket that I made. On this design of engine, the cylinder walls are quite thin, and there is not much meat for the gasket to seat against the cast iron. So I have to be careful here. And also, the holes are quite a tight fit on the studs. This is intentional. I prefer it to be this way. It stops the pressure from leaking up the stud and bubbling around the nuts. And I make a simple tool to do this. It's just a piece of brass drilled which clears the thread and you just press it down very, very carefully a bit at a time. With all of the bottom studs and the bottom gasket in place, it's now time to repeat the process on the top for the cylinder cover. And the operation is identical to the one that I've just shown, except the studs are shorter. And once again, it is vital to make sure that the studs are all at the same height, so frequent checks with the ruler is a good idea. And eventually you arrive in the happy position where you can put the last stud in place. Although on this engine, being a bit weirdly made, there is another stud that goes right down in between the steamways, which is not a brilliant idea, but that's the way it is, so I'll go with that. Normally when you have a multiple stud arrangement like this, which is very prototypical to the full size, but on a model, it's a good idea to make a dummy stud that just threads into the cover at the point where the steamway is. This engine has a stud right in the middle of the steamway, which means there's really not much surface area for the cylinder cover to seal the cylinder. 
I'll have to look into this when I get the engine fully back together. As I said previously, there's not much meat on this gasket at all, but I am going to be using some sealant as well as the gasket, so watch this space to see whether it leaks right at the end. So the gasket's fitted, and the easiest way to fully seat the gasket is to tap the cylinder cover into place. And for obvious reasons, I couldn't do this with the lower cylinder cover. Maybe the man who built it got a rotary table for Christmas, because the studs are exactly in the right place on both ends of the cylinder. The cylinder will fit any way round, which is very, very unusual, especially taking into consideration the state of the rest of the engine. So it's not all death and destruction and doom and gloom in the world. The engine's starting to look good now. Thanks for watching, and I hope you found it useful.